Suspense. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Mr. Sidney Greenstreet, one of Hollywood's most sensational newcomers in a number of years. The famed fat man who lent his suspenseful talents to the Maltese Falcon and across the Pacific. Mr. Greenstreet is with us to create on the air John Dixon Carr's celebrated detective, Dr. Gideon Fell. The story called The Hangman Won't Wait is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with The Hangman Won't Wait and Mr. Greenstreet's performance. We again hope to keep you in suspense. He comes striding towards us now, beaming like old King Cole. You can probably hear him chuckle. If he wheezes a little, that's due to weighing more than 300 pounds. Slander, a gross slander. You notice the three chins and the bandit's mustache and the eyeglasses on the black ribbon. He removes his hat with old school courtesy. Uh, uh, Don't try to bow, doctor. He is Gideon Fell, doctor of philosophy and expert in crime. If he tells us something about the Barton case. Sir, I have only one remark to make about the Barton case. Everybody was wrong. I'm afraid we don't quite follow that. The judge was wrong. The jury were wrong. The prosecution was wrong. The defense was wrong. But, Dr. Fell, you can't have a murder case in which everybody is wrong. In my cases, sir, you can have practically anything. Oh, yes, that's true enough, but, uh... I want you to imagine yourself in the position of that girl, Helen Barton. Well? Imagine yourself waking up suddenly in the middle of the night. You're terrified. You don't know why. The room is cold and nearly dark. All of a sudden, you realize it's a room you've never seen before. There's a queer smell like old stone and disinfectant. There's no sound except... I... I... What is it? What was that? Now lean back in your bed, dearie. It's all right. Yes, take it easy, miss. I... I was dreaming. You were having a nightmare, dearie. But it's all right now. Nothing's going to hurt you. Not yet. Be quiet, Anna. All right, all right. Would you like us to turn on all the lights, miss? Please, would you do that? You see, I... I don't understand this. Where am I and how did I get here? And who are you? Now, don't start that all over again, please. Start what all over again? Saying you've lost your memory and don't even know what your name is. Are you insane? Of course I know what my name is. I'm Helen Barton. Ah. But it's all I do know. Where am I? Why on earth is it so cold? Well, that's not unusual, you know, for England in the middle of December. Did you say December? That's right, dearie. 18th of December. You're fooling me. You're playing a trick on me. My head feels queer and I want to start crying, but I won't. It's not December. It's the end of August. I was going up to see Philip. Oh, that's it. I was going up to see Philip. Philip? Philip Gale, the man I'm going to marry. Be quiet, Anna. And don't turn on these lights yet. She's having a son. She's... Anna! This child's shaking all over. And so help me, she don't know where she is. Listen, dearie. I'm going to sit down on the bed beside you. Now take my hands. Hold them tight. What's wrong? Why are you looking at me like that? This is a maiders' prison, miss. Steady, dearie. I'm still dreaming. I must be. You can't mean I'm in prison. Now look, dearie. 
I'm afraid it's worse than that. Worse than that? Look over there. You see where there's a little bit of fire in the grate? Well... And paper on the wall and pictures and a carpet on the floor. Oh, why don't you come out straight and tell her? They're going to hang you in the morning, miss. This is the condemned cell. Sudden shock, the prison clock smote on the shivering air. But I won't quote that any further. I have too vivid a memory of sitting up that night with Colonel Andrews, the governor of the prison. Over here, you'd call him the warden. It was a little office with a lamp shade, tilted so that I could see his face. And he said... I hate executions. Loathe them. Can't even sleep the night before. If you hadn't offered to come here and save my life... This is a strange place, sir, to talk of saving lives. No, it's no good being sentimental about the thing. That's the law. I didn't make it. But I gather you're not exactly happy about this case. I'm not. And that's a fact. Mind you... There's no doubt whatever about the girl's guilt. I'm gratified to hear it. But if only she'd confess. Most of them do, you know. They confess to you? To me or to the hangman. Not often to the chaplain, because they think he'll threaten them with the hereafter. But when Kirkwood goes in with the strap to bind their arm, he says to him, I don't like to think I'm doing something that would be on my conscience. So if you'd care <laughs> to tell me... <laughs> <laughs> Quite a sensitive fellow you are, Hag. And look here, I'm serious. So am I. Sometimes I wish I had any job in the world but mine. If only the girl would confess. If she'd just stop this nonsense about not remembering. Not remembering what? Not remembering how... Well, not remembering how she shot Philip Gale. Not remembering anything, even her own name. Total amnesia covering a crime. Sir, you frighten me. You mean to say that a woman suffering from loss of memory can be tried and sentenced to death? No. Not if she really has lost her memory. Well, then... But this defense was a fake. You're quite sure of that? Naturally. The judge would never have allowed it to come to trial if he hadn't been convinced that she was shamming. Even then, she might have got off with a life sentence or even with manslaughter if it hadn't been for the nature of the crime. She didn't cut anybody up, I hope. No, but it was almost as bad. She shot a man who had raised his hands and begged for mercy. That completely damned her in the eyes of the jury. And yet, you have doubts. I tell you, I haven't any doubts. And in any case, it's none of my business. How has she acted since she's been here? Oh, a model prisoner. But I wish she'd stop this business of seeming to be in a daze. It's getting on my nerves. I'd rather think the prison itself would get on my nerves. I looked into your execution shed once, and I don't want to look again. Oh, you get used to it after a while. Helen Barton won't. Tell me about her. Nice girl, too. I knew her grandfather. Live near here? Yes. Born and bred in Maidhurst. She got mixed up with a thoroughgoing swine named Philip Gale. Crazy about him. Wouldn't hear a word against him. Then he threw her over for a woman with money. I see. He had a bungalow on White Rose Hill. She went up there one Sunday afternoon. Alone? Yes. Herbert Gale, Philip's brother, heard them screaming at each other. He ran in to see what was wrong. Philip was trying to chase the girl out. She grabbed a thirty-two revolver out of the table drawer and told Philip to put up his hands. That scared him, and he did put up his hands. Then she shot him dead. And afterwards? Afterwards, she couldn't remember. Didn't remember anything? No. Pretended she didn't even recognize her own family. She said, who is Philip Gale? Mm-hmm. And you hang her tomorrow morning? Yes. Without ever hearing her side of the case? Well, confound it, man. There's no doubt about the evidence. Are you sure? She killed Philip Gale. Gale's brother Herbert saw her do it. 
This hypocrisy about not remembering. Emotional shock could do just that, you know. Oh, she wasn't so emotionally shocked that it disturbed her aim. She drilled him clean through the heart at 15 feet. The bullet entered in a dead straight line through coat, waistcoat, shirt, and heart. You could have run a pencil through the holes. Now, don't sit there puffing out your cheeks and waving a cigar at me. I'm only... <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Colonel Andrews, aren't you talking to convince yourself? No. Suppose that girl is telling the truth. Suppose she has lost her memory. Yeah. All right. You don't believe that. Suppose it. And suppose in some black hour just before the hangman comes... That a memory returns. Don't talk rubbish. But I've lived long enough to know that mental suffering is the cruelest form of suffering on this earth. Imagine yourself in that position. Come out of a daze into what you thought was a safe and pleasant world. You don't know where you are. You don't know what's happened. You only know that when the clock strikes eight, they're going to take you out and... Did you hear that? Yes. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yes. It isn't possible. I very much fear it is. Sometimes, you know, we have to use drugs. Drugs? Yes. When we take them to the execution shed. It's only a short distance and we try to get it over in a matter of seconds, but sometimes they can't walk. Yes? What is it? Beg pardon, sir. But I thought I'd better get you, or the doctor, or the chaplain, or both. Well, what's the matter with you men? You're as white as a ghost. Can't help that, sir. I've been a warder at this place for a matter of 15 years, but I never knew anything like this. It's the uh, upstairs room, I suppose, Miss uh, Barton? Yes, sir. Hysterical? Yes, sir. She says, well, she says she remembers now. I see. She's carrying on something awful, sir, but that ain't all. She claims she never done it. What's that? She claims she never killed Mr. Gale at all. Well, that's all, Harris. You may go. Yes, sir. Any other disturbances in the building? Well, sir, they're, they're a bit restless and A-wing. Oh, that's usual. Yes, sir. And there's a bloke uh, outside the prison, I mean, who keeps hanging about in front of the main gate. You can see him by the street lamp. First, he'll take a few little quick steps back and forth. Then he'll run and stick his face against the bars of the gate. Then he'll go back to pacing again. Fair gave me the creeps it did even before this other thing. You don't happen to know who he is? It's the other Mr. Gale, sir. Herbert Gale. I haven't the art to chase him away. All right, Harris, go ahead. I'll be along in a minute. Yes, sir. So the girl claims to be innocent. You heard that, eh? Yes, I heard it. What do you mean to do? I'll see the girl, of course. But it won't affect the issue. Not even if she does happen to be innocent. Fell in the name of heaven, try to understand my position. Believe me, I do understand it. The jury convicted this girl of murder. Her appeal was dismissed. The Home Secretary has refused to intervene on behalf of the King. You couldn't do anything even if you wanted to. You couldn't even appeal to the Home Secretary without new evidence. Exactly. And it's too late for new evidence, because you can't just accept the word of Helen Barton. All the same, I'm dreading this interview. Uh, it's uh, against regulations, but uh, I wish you'd come along with me. Oh, if only something... There isn't. <laughs> Where's the whiskey? I, I I think a little stimulant. She will need the stimulant. Well, it's a cold night. It'll be colder yet where she's going. The governor and the big stout gentlemen believe you didn't do it. Oh, no, they don't. You needn't try to fool me. Look at them over there in the corner whispering. Fell, she's lying. I heard that. You said, Fell, she's lying, but I'm not lying. I'm not. Yes, you've got to pull yourself together. And have a nice breakfast. What would you like for breakfast?
the Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense, Columbia's play theater of outstanding thrillers, produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from fiction and stage and screen, from the world's great literature of entertaining excitement, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story, by America's distinguished author-playwright Owen Johnson, gathers its suspense in a very gentle way. It doesn't have a spectacular finish, garnished with revolver shots. There are no graveyard watches. There's not so much as a single lifeless body, identified or unidentified. It's a tale told in a club room, the Artists and Writers Club in New York. A tale of high-class robbery and suspicion and of how some ladies and gentlemen nervously counted 100 in the dark. Ah, that was a fine meal. Me for the club any time. Uh, here, we can all sit here, Freddy. Yes, if you'll just draw up that chair for Mr. Peters. Oh, yeah, thank you. Peters. Thank you. Uh, do you all know Peters? Uh, this is Mr. Steingall. Well, how do you do? I know you. Uh, Mr. Goldier? Oh, I, I believe we've met. Oh, yes, yes. yes. How are you? Oh, you myself. know each other. Yes, yes. And the one who drew up the chair, Mr. Rankin. How do you do? Thank well, you I guess, I, I guess we're all acquainted now. Um, to get back to our table discussion, Quinny. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, how about a drink? Who'll join me? Oh, oh yeah, pleasure. pleasure. Fine, yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. fine. Uh, John. Well, now, Steingall, as I said... There are only half a dozen stories in the world. What is more to the point? There's every reason Yes, to... sir. What? Oh. Uh, five uh, with soda, John. Yes, sir. Now, now, where was I? Oh, oh, yes. What is more to the point, gentlemen, is the small number of human relations that are so simple and yet so fundamental that they can be eternally played upon, redressed and reinterpreted in every language and every age, and yet remain inexhaustible in the possibility of variation. Well, that's true, of course. It's very uh, possible. Take the eternal triangle. Two men and a woman, or two women and a man. Its variations extend to thousands. Is that right, Rankin? Well, in a way. Ah, here we are. Uh, set them down right there, John. Very well, sir. Uh, a little soda. Uh, here you are. Uh, thank you. And you? Uh, uh, oh, thank you. Soda, Peter? Yes, please. Uh, another one. Here you are. Thanks. And here's yours. Thank you. And now, a little soda in mine. Uh, well, here's to you all. Mm, sure. Cheers, cheers. Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid we can't see eye to eye, Quinny. I believe there are situations, original situations, that are independent of your human emotions, that exist just because they are situations, accidental and nothing else. As for instance? Well, I'll just cite an ordinary one that happens to come to my mind. In a group of five men, well, such as we are here, a theft takes place. One man is the thief. Now, which one? Now, I'd like to know what emotion that interprets. And yet it certainly is an original theme at the bottom of a whole literature. It's not the same thing at all. Ah, detective stories. I could answer that the situation you give can be traced back to the commonest of human emotions. Curiosity. I think uh, Quinny has you there, Rankin. Hmm. What is the peculiar fascination that the detective problem exercises over the human mind? You will say, curiosity. Hmm, yes. And no. Admit at once that the whole art of a detective story consists in the statement of the problem. Anyone can do it. I can do it. Steingall can do it. Uh, Rankin, I believe even you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> the solution doesn't count. It is usually banal. It should be prohibited. 
What interests us is, can we guess it? There you have it, the problem, the detective story. Now, why the fascination? I'll tell you. It appeals to our curiosity. Yes, but deeper to a sort of intellectual vanity. Five men present. The theft takes place. Who's the thief? Who will guess it first? Whose brains will show its superior cleverness? You see? That's all. That's all there is to it. Out of all of which, the interesting thing is that Rankin has supplied the reason why the supply of detective fiction is inexhaustible. It does all come down to the simplest terms. Five possibilities, one answer. Well, the reason is that the situation does constantly occur. It's a situation that any of us might get into any time. Yes, I know of an incident of that kind that happened to a friend of mine last month. Of course, of course, gentlemen, you are glorifying commonplaces. Every crime, I tell you, expresses itself in the terms of the picture puzzle that you feed your six-year-old. It's only the variation that is interesting. Well, take the well-known instance of the visitor at a club and the rare coin, for example. Well, you all know that story. You've heard uh, it, haven't you? I don't oh, think I have. I'm not sure. Why, it's, it's very well-known. Oh, go ahead, Quinny. Tell it. A distinguished visitor is brought into a club. A dozen men, say, present at dinner, long table. Conversation finally veers around to curiosities and relics. One of the members present then takes from his pocket what he announces as one of the rarest coins in existence. Passes it around the table. Coin travels back and forth, everyone examining it. And the conversation goes to another topic. All at once, the owner calls for his coin. It is nowhere to be found. Everyone looks at everyone else. First, they suspect a joke. Then it becomes serious. The coin is immensely valuable. Who has taken it? The owner is a gentleman. Does the gentlemanly, idiotic thing, of course. Laughs as he knows someone is playing a practical joke on him and that the coin will be returned tomorrow. The others refuse to leave the situation so. One man proposes that they all submit to a search. Everyone gives his assent until it comes to the stranger. He refuses, curtly, roughly, without giving any reason. Uncomfortable silence. The man is a guest. No one knows him particularly well, but still he is a guest. One member tries to make him understand that no offense is offered, that the suggestion was simply to clear the atmosphere. The stranger becomes very firm, very proud, and says, I refuse to allow my person to be searched, and I refuse to give the reason for my action. Another silence. The visitor evidently has the coin, but he is their guest, and etiquette protects him. <laughs> nice situation, eh? Well, what's the well. answer? The table is cleared. A waiter removes a dish of fruit, and there, under the ledge of the plate, where it's been pushed, is the coin. Banal explanation, eh? Of course. Solutions always should be. At once, everyone apologizes to him. Whereupon the visitor rises and says, Now I can give you the reason for my refusal to be searched. There are only two known specimens of that coin in existence. And the second happens to be here in my vest pocket. That's rather obvious. <laughs> of course, the story is well invented. But the turn to it is very nice. Very nice, indeed. Well, I don't know. The ending is very unsatisfactory. The visitor should have hit on him not another coin, but uh, something absolutely different. Something uh, destructive, say, of a, a woman's reputation and a... Great tragedy should have been threatened by the casual misplacing of the coin. Well, I've heard the same story told in a dozen different ways. Oh, it's happened a hundred times. It must continually happen. I know of one extraordinary instance, in fact, the most extraordinary instance of this sort I've ever heard. Peters, you rascal. I see you've been quietly letting us set the stage for you. Well, it's <laughs> not a story that will please everyone. Why not? Because you will want to know what no one can ever know. It has no conclusion, then? Yes and no. As far as it concerns a woman, quite the most remarkable woman I've ever met, the story is complete. Uh, do I know the woman? Possibly. Probably, I should say. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, this should be particularly interesting to you because <clears throat> I believe that most of you are acquainted with the people involved. Uh, the names, of course, are disguised. I think... Uh, yes, I have. Just time before I catch my train to tell it to you. <laughs> Mrs. Well, Mrs. Rita Kildare inhabited a charming bachelor girl studio. Very elegant. With a duplex pattern in one of the buildings just off Central Park West. 
She knew very nearly everyone in that indescribable society in New York that's drawn from all levels and that imposes but one condition for membership, to be amusing. In this mingled society, her invitations were eagerly sought. Her dinners were spontaneous, and the discussions, though gay and usually daring, were invariably under the control of wit and good taste. On the Sunday night of this adventure, she had, according to our custom, sent away her Filipino butler and invited to an informal chafing dish supper seven of her more unusual friends. At seven o'clock, having finished dressing, she put in order her bedroom, which formed a sort of free passage between the studio and a small dining room to the kitchen beyond. Then, going into the studio, she struck a match and was about to light the candlesticks which illuminated the room when the bell rang and a Mr. Flanders, a broker, compact, nervously alive, well-groomed, was waiting as she opened the door. Well, you're early. On the contrary, you are late. <laughs> well, in any case, hello, and come inside. Here, let me take your things. Thank you. Well, I'm the first, I suppose. Of course. And since you are, you can be a good boy and help me with the candles. Delighted. Who's to be here tonight? The Enos Jacksons. I thought they were separated. Not yet. How interesting. Only you, dear lady, would dream of serving us a couple on the verge. It is interesting, isn't it? Assuredly. Uh, where did you know Jackson? Through the Warings. Uh, Jackson's a rather doubtful person, isn't he? Uh, well, let's call him a very sharp lawyer. Uh, they tell me, though, he's been gambling pretty much. In deep. How about yourself? Oh, me? I'm a bachelor. If I lose my shirt, it makes no difference. Is that possible? Probably even. Who else is coming? Oh, uh, Maud Lilly. You know her? No, I don't think so. You met her here some time ago, a journalist. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'd forgotten. Mr. Harris, the clubman, is coming, and the Stanley Cheevers. Stanley Cheevers? Are we going to gamble? Don't tell me you object. <laughs> Certainly not. Only the Cheevers. <laughs> they play quite a game. Yes, well united. <laughs> they have an unusual streak of good luck. Oh, by the way, it's uh, Jackson, isn't it, who is so attractive to Mrs. Cheever? Quite right. What a charming party. Hey, where does Maud Lilly come in? Don't joke. She's in a desperate way. And young Harris? Oh, he's to make the salad and cream the chicken. Ah, see the whole party. I, of course, am to add the element of respectability. Of what? Don't play baby with me, my dear Flanders. I apologize. That's better. No one, of course, knows who else is coming. No one, of course. The Stanley Cheevers enter. A short, fat man with a vacant, fat face and slow-moving eye. And his wife, voluble, nervous, overdressed, and pretty. Mr... Yes, Mr. Harris came in with Maud Lilly. A woman, straight, dark, Indian, great masses of somber hair, held in a little too loosely for neatness, with thick, quick lips and eyes that rolled away from the person who was talking to her. The Enos Jacksons were late, and still agitated as they entered. His forehead had not quite banished the scowl, nor her eyes the scorn. He was of the type that never lost his temper, but caused others to lose theirs. Mrs. Jackson seemed fastened to her husband by an invisible leash. You looked at her curiously and wondered what such a nature would do in a crisis with a lurking sense of a woman who carried with her her own impending tragedy. As soon as the company had been completed and the incongruity of the selection had been perceived, a smile of malicious anticipation ran the rounds, which the hostess cut short by saying... Well, well, now that everyone's here, this is the order for the night. You can quarrel all you want, you can whisper all the gossip you can think of about one another, but everyone is to be amusing. Also, everyone is to help with dinner. And nothing formal, nothing serious. We may all be bankrupt, divorced, or dead tomorrow, but tonight we'll be gay. That's the invariable rule of the house. <laughs> Now, if you 
you'll excuse me, I'll get on with the cooking. Uh, Harris, I'll need you. Right with you. May I be of any help? Thank you, Maud, dear. Oh, Mrs. Cheever, you might right. come along, too. All right. This is an adorable bedroom. Oh, thank you, dear. Uh, now for my apron. Oh, there it is. Uh, tie me up in the back, will you please, Maud? Of course. There you are. Fine, thanks. Now, just let me get my rings off, and I'll be all ready to go to work. Oh, this is such a lovely apartment, Mrs. Kildare. Thanks. Soap and water always seem to do it. Ah, there. Your rings are so beautiful. They are nice, aren't they? But there's only one that's very valuable, the sapphire. Oh, it's beautiful. Let me see. Oh, well, it must be very valuable. It cost 10000 six years ago. Mm -hmm. It's been my talisman ever since. For the moment, however, I'm a cook. You're not going to leave the rings there. Why, of course. Now, I'm the cook. Uh, Maud Lily, you're the scullery maid. Harris is the chef, and we're all under his orders. Mrs. Cheever, mm. did you ever peel onions? Oh, good heavens, no. <laughs> well, there are no onions to peel. All you have to do is help set the table. <laughs> Under their hostess's gay guidance, the seven guests began to circulate busily through the rooms, laying the table, grouping the chairs, opening bottles, and preparing the material for the chafing dishes. Mrs. Kildare, in the kitchen, ransacked the icebox, and with her own hand, shredded the chicken and measured the cream. Flanders, carry this in carefully. Cheever! Stop watching your wife and put the salad bowl on the table. <laughs> Everything ready, Harris? All set. All right. Uh, everyone sit down. I'll be right in. She went into her bedroom, took off her apron, and hung it in the closet. Then going to her dressing table, she drew the hat pin around which were her rings from the pin cushion and carelessly slipped them on her fingers. But all at once, she frowned and looked quickly at her hand. Only two rings were there. The third ring, the sapphire, was missing. Stupid. She said to herself and returned to her dressing table. Immediately she stopped. She remembered quite clearly putting the hat pin through the three rings. She made no attempt to search further, but remained without moving, her fingers slowly drumming on the table. Who had taken the ring? Each of her guests had had a dozen opportunities in the course of the time she'd been busy in the kitchen. She ran over their characters and their situations as she knew them. Strangely enough, at each, her mind stopped upon some reason that might explain a sudden temptation. To find out nothing this way. That's not the important thing to me just now. The important thing is to get the ring back. And slowly, deliberately, she began to walk back and forth, her clenched hand beating the deliberate, rhythmic measure of her journey. Five minutes later, as Harris, installed as chef over the chafing dish, was giving directions, spoon in the air, Mrs. Kildare came into the room like a lengthening shadow. Her entrance had been made with scarcely a perceptible sound, and yet each guest was aware of it at the same moment with a little nervous start. Heavens, heavens, dear lady. You come in on us like a Greek tragedy. What is it you have for us, a surprise? I have something to say to you. Mr. Enos Jackson. Yes, Miss Kilder? Kindly do as I ask you. Well, certainly. Go to the door. Go to the door? Please. Yes? Lock it. And bring me the key. Here you are. You've locked it? As you wish me to. Thank you. Now, the bedroom door. Would you do the same? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Cheever. Eh? Yeah. Would you blow out all the candles except the candelabra on the table? Blow out all the candles? Except the candelabra. All right. Well, uh, for goodness sake, Mrs. Kildare, what is it? I am getting terribly worked up. I, my I'm nerves are all sorry, made up. Mrs. Jackson. 
That's the last candle. All right. Now listen. My sapphire ring has just been stolen. Oh, you don't believe it. The ring's been taken within the last 20 minutes. I'm not going to mince words. The ring has been taken, and the thief is among you. But Mrs. Kilbury, is it possible? Yes, Mrs. Cheever. There's not the slightest doubt. Three of you were in the bedroom when I placed my rings on the pincushion. Quite true. I was in the room when she took them off. The sapphire ring was on top. Each of you has passed through there a dozen times since. My sapphire ring is gone, and one of you has taken it. For heaven's sake. Now, now listen. I'm not going to miss words. I'm not going to stand on ceremony. But I'm going to have my ring back. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to have that ring back. And until I do, not a soul shall leave this room. I don't care who's taken it. All I want is my ring. Now, I'm going to make it possible for whoever took it to restore it without possibility of detection. The doors are locked and will stay locked. I'm going to blow out the remaining candles in the candelabra. And we're going to count 100 slowly. It will be in absolute darkness. No one will know or see what's done. But if, at the end of that time, the ring is not here on the table, I shall telephone the police and have everyone in this room searched. Well, am I quite clear? Everyone take his place about the table and uh, remain standing, please. That's it. That'll do. Now, I'll blow out the candles and count 100. No more, no less. Remember, either I get that ring or everyone in this room will be searched. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, <clears throat> twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight. 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, What's 45, that? Foot slapped off the chair, 46, I'm sorry. 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73. The ring. 74. Well, there it is. On the table. 75, well, it is. 76, yes. 77, 78, 79. 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, oh, really? 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, one hundred. Well, it is there, isn't it? Mr. Cheever, you may hand it to me. Well, now that that's over, we can have a very gay little supper. The light, someone. <laughs> And 
There you are, gentlemen. Oh, I say, Peters, that's not all. Absolutely. The story ends there? Story ends there. But uh, who took the ring? <laughs> what? You mean, never found out? Never. No clue? None. I'm not sure I like the story. Uh, it's no story at all. Permit me, it is a story. And it is complete. In fact, I consider it unique because it has none of the banalities of a solution and leaves the problem even more confused than at the start. Well, I don't of see... Of course what... you don't see, my dear Enkin. You do not see that any solution would be commonplace, whereas no solution leaves an extraordinary intellectual problem. Well, how so? Well, in the first place, whether the situation actually happened or not, which is in itself a mere triviality, Peters has constructed it in a masterly way, the proof of which is that he has made me listen. Any of those present might have taken the ring. There are therefore seven solutions, all possible and all logical. But beyond this is left a great intellectual problem. How so? Was it a woman who lacked the necessary courage to continue? Or was it a man who repented his first impulse? Is a man or is a woman the greater natural criminal? Oh, that's simple, Quinny. A woman took it, of course. You know, on the contrary, it was a man, for the second action was more difficult than the first. A man, certainly. The restoration of the ring was a logical decision. You see? Personally, I incline to a woman, for the reason that a weaker feminine nature is strangely susceptible to the domination of her own sex. There you are. We could meet and debate the subject year in and year out and never agree. Uh, I, I recognize most of the characters, Peters. Uh, Mrs. Kildare, of course, is all you say of her. An extraordinary woman. The story is quite characteristic of her. Flanders, I'm not sure of, but I think I know him. I'm positive I do. Did it really happen? Exactly as I told it. The only one I don't recognize is Harris, your humble servant. What? You, Peters? You were there? I was there. I was Harris. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Oh, yes, what is it, John? Mr. Peters, sir, your train. You told me to remind you. Oh, thank you. Yes, I didn't know it was so late. Will you gentlemen pardon me? Well, huh? Of course. Of course sir. Nice to meet you all. <coughs> Night. Yeah. Curious chap. Extraordinary. Well, now, I... I wonder... I wonder if we're wondering the same thing, gentlemen. And so, with the enigmatic smile of Mr. Peters, or Harris, ends 100 in the Dark, Owen Johnson's smooth story which gave us tonight's... Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. Tonight's radio drama was written by Jack Anson Fink, directed by John Dietz, and scored by Bernard Herman. Eric Dressler was Mr. Peters, Alice Frost played Mrs. Kildare, and Ted Osborne, Quinny. Others in the cast were Helen Lewis, Joan Shea, Henriette Kay, Frank Reddick, Paul Luther, Stefan Schnabel, Ian Martin, and Barry Kroger. With this evening's performance, Columbia brings to a conclusion the present series of Suspense. If you've liked these broadcasts, CBS would be pleased to hear from you. Suspense has been a series presented for your relaxation and enjoyment by the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mm -hmm.